So what we're going to talk about now is we're going to talk about invertible transformations, and this is from 6.4. And so I want to start out with this fact that we talked about at the end of the last one where we were talking about one-to-one -one and onto. We saw that for a transformation to be both one-to-one -one and onto, then the dimension of V would have to equal the dimension of W. So we actually have to have two, dimension, uh, two spaces that are, in fact, of the same size. So let's imagine what a transformation might look like that was like this. So we'll start out with, we've got V over here, okay? And we have W over here, okay? And both of those, they have the same dimension, okay? And let's say, for example, that T, our transformation is, in fact, one-to-one -one and onto. So we've got T. Now what that means is that if I take a, a vector, W, okay, well, First, it means that the range of t, okay, the range of t is equal to all of w. So that means that I can take any w in w, any single one of them, call it w1, and it's going to go back to a v1. Like, it's actually going to be able to map backwards, okay? w2 will back back to a v2, all right? So we actually are going to be able to be, do that backwards mapping for every vector within w, okay? In addition to that, what we also know is, is that t is 1 to 1. So 1, that means that the kernel of t, okay, is just equal to the 0 vector. And so the 0 vector only, alone, goes back to the 0 vector. And in addition to that, what it means is that every single uh, element, so w1 goes back to v1 only. w2 goes back to v2 only, okay? That's the only, thing, the only way that that will happen, all right? w3 we'll go back to say a V3, and that's the only way it'll happen, okay? That's one-to-one, -one, right? We take something that's in the codomain and it'll map back to one and only one element in the domain. Now, the reason why that's so important is this. What that allows us to do is it allows us to say, okay, if I start over here in W, okay? So if I start in W, then I know where I'm going in V. So hopefully, you know, as you think about this, it kind of makes some sense. I'm going to pick a W2. Now, one, I know I can pick W2 because uh, T is on 2, all right? So I can actually, I'll find W2 from that transformation. It's T of V2, all right? I know I'm going to have W2 mapping back to something in V2. And the second thing is, is that I know that W2 maps back to V2 because it's one-to-one, -one, all right? So what that's going to allow me to do is it's going to allow me to create a transformation that allows me to go backwards, okay? It allows me, it has this thing called T inverse, right? And T inverse allows me to go from W2 to V2. T inverse, okay, is going to allow me from, to go from W3 back to V3. And T inverse will allow me to do things like go from W1 back to V1, right? And you have to understand that if, it, if the transformation is not, in fact, one-to-one -one and onto, then we won't actually be able to find this inverse, okay? So this inverse is not possible. So let's define T inverse, all right? So the inverse of T, V to W, is we call it T inverse W to V is the transformation such that when I take T inverse T of V, it'll equal V. Okay, so when I compose T inverse with T and I operate on it by operate on a vector V with it, I get V back. Okay, kind of the way that we think about this from a pictorial representation standpoint. Here's V, here's W. Okay, I start with V. Okay, and I'm going to end up at T of V utilizing T. Okay, so that's my direction. And then backwards, okay, I'm going to end up back, T of V is going to take me, or T inverse is going to take me back to V. Okay, so that's kind of like my composition idea. I take T to T of V, and then I take T inverse back to V. Okay, and you can see, right, that with T, the domain is V, and the codomain is W, and with T inverse, the domain is W, and the codomain is V. Okay, so that's the relationship right there. 
And it turns out that we could actually also, in fact, strengthen this statement. And one of the ways that we're going to strengthen the statement is, is that we'll consider a w belonging to w. Okay, so suppose, right, w belongs to w. Then we can also go the opposite way, right? We're going to take t inverse, all right, to t inverse of w, which we'll call uh, a v, okay, or think about it as v. Um, and then we can go backwards, all right, using t. So then t inverse of w, okay, and then we'll act on it by t, is going to end up equaling w. So on the one hand, we could take t inverse t of v, and that'll give me v if I start over in the in the domain of t, okay? Or if I start over here in w, I could take any w and w and utilize the inverse to go back to v, all right? And then head back to w using t, all right? So basically, this inverse allows me to go backwards and forwards between the domain and the codomain, right? And it has a connection, right? between any two elements, and that connection is strong, it's absolute, right? Since it's one to one, since t is one to one, and since t is also on to. Right, so now we have a theorem that's actually really important for us to be able to determine that t is in fact invertible, okay, or that it has an inverse. So we're gonna let t v to w be represented by a matrix A, and then we have t inverse w to v be represented by a matrix B. Then what we get is that A will be invertible and B will equal A inverse, okay? So we wanna to think to ourselves, well, what do I need for something to be invertible? First, I need to show, I need to show A is square. Well, to show that A is square, right, I recall that if t has an inverse, then t is one to one and onto. And if t is one to one and onto, okay, then the dimension of v equals the dimension of w. All right? So the dimension of the input space and the dimension of the output space are actually equal to each other. Okay, thus, the number of columns and rows, columns equals the number of rows in A. And what I would challenge you to do is to actually go in, draw out some matrices and see that this is in fact the case. Okay, because it is, it's true, right? Equals the number of rows. So A is squared. Then two, we need to show that A, right, okay, let's say that um, what we want to do, A, uh, AX equals zero has only the trivial solution. Let's do that one. Because if I can show that that's the case, then by the IMT, what I know is, is that, or the invertible matrix theorem, I know that in fact, A is invertible. Well, as T, is one to one, A, the kernel of T equals zero. Previously we showed what that means is, is that AX equals zero or the null space of A, that's the null space of A equals zero. And so the only solution to AX equals zero is the trivial solution. So A is invertible by the IMT. Ta-da, there we are. So now we know that A actually is in fact invertible. Now, so T has an inverse called T inverse. And if that's the case, then we have our matrix A for T is in fact invertible. Now all we've got to do is show that B equals A inverse.
Now we want to show B equals A inverse. Okay, so, right, T, T inverse of X will equal X. Thus, okay, because remember now we're looking co composition, excuse me, actually I should say T of X, T inverse, okay, of X equals X. Thus, what that means is, is that B, A, X equals X, right, which equals I, X, right, and, or I, yeah, I, N, X. So B, A equals I, N, all right, then T, T inverse of Y, okay, equals Y. Thus, we get that A, B, Y equals Y, which equals I, Y, or I, N, Y. Thus, A, B, Y, or excuse me, A, B equals I, N. Okay. So, B, A equals A, B equals I, N. Thus, B is the inverse of A. And A inverse equals B. And there it is. So really nice, if we could transform our transformation into a matrix, then all I've got to do is show that the matrix is invertible and I'm done, okay? Or if I know that T happens to be one to one and on to, then that also tells me that A, its matrix for the transformation is invertible. Done, right? Gives me a tons of, tons of information, all right? What we want to see is, is that this is just, the idea of T and T inverse is the complementary idea that goes along with um, a matrix A being in fact invertible, okay? So again, like I was saying, all you've got to do in order to show that T is invertible, okay, or that T has an inverse is to show that its matrix is invertible. Or if you know that its matrix is invertible, then you know that T has an inverse, right? Vice versa, okay? And they essentially have like the same basic structure. Now, why not just, you know, use matrices? Okay, again, one of those questions like why linear transformations? And a lot of that has to do with how we think about math, okay? Um, mathematically, a transformation has some really special properties in that a transformation doesn't have to go from spaces in R to other spaces in R, right? We can actually have a transformation that moves from, say, for example, um, you know, the set of all polynomials into uh, R, right, like Rn, right? Or we could have a, a matrix that goes from P2R into Rn, okay? And we can imagine a transformation that like kind of moves between all these different spaces that allows us to do lots of work in Rn, right, which is really easy where we can write matrices and do all that kind of stuff, but then think about polynomials, right? Or then think about, say, for example, matrices, okay? Or think about differential equations, for example, all right? So transformation allows us to do that. And it also allows us to kind of like operate more abstractly because transformations are necessarily more abstract than matrices. Matrices generally have a tendency, we can make them abstract, but they're not to the same level of, you know, um, again, abstractness, okay? So what that gives us, or this idea of invertibility or the inverse of transformation, it gives us the idea of something called isomorphism, okay? So two spaces, okay, are isomorphic. If we can construct an isomorphism, okay, between them. All right, and then we need to define what an isomorphism is, okay? An isomorphism is a transformation with an inverse that has an inverse. In other words, that is one-to-one -one and onto. <coughs> All right? 
So if we can actually create a transformation that has an inverse, all right, then what we can do is we can construct an isomorphism between any two spaces. Now those two spaces are then said to be isomorphic. Okay. Now some things that we have to get about what does it mean for two spaces to be isomorphic, right? Well, first we need to know that the transformation has an inverse. Okay. So, right. Suppose, okay. V and W are two spaces. Then for t V and W to be isomorphic, we need to know that the dimension of V has to equal the dimension of W. They have to have the, actually the same dimension. And if you think about that, we talked a little bit about that, right? Okay. I am basically going to have to, one, my kernel, okay, the zero vector is going to have to go over to the zero vector by itself, right? And then what we need is we need all the dimensions, right? Okay, here's n dimensions over here in V, and they have to map over to n dimensions over here in W, okay? So they have to have the same dimensions for us to even like be able to consider that they might be isomorphic, all right? And after that, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to actually generate an isomorphism. But that's not so bad, right? We can generate an isomorphism basically by, you know, seeing if we can map standard bases onto standard bases, right? That's how we actually generate a lot of isomorphisms, all right? So let's take, for example, all right, um, P2R and R3. Now P2R, the set of all, um, P2R, excuse me, right? So the dimension of P2R is equal to three, okay? It's represented, by the way, by the standard basis one, x, and x squared, all right? And then R3, we also know, is three-dimensional as well. And it can be represented by the column vectors 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. Okay, cool. There it is. All right. Now, what I want to get here is, is that then I construct my transformation. I'm going to say that T, okay, and what it'll do is it's going to, T is going to take 1, 0, 0. is going to equal 1. And t of 0, 1, 0, that'll equal x. And t of 0, 0, 1, it's going to equal x squared. Okay? So all we're going to do is we're going to construct a theoretical transformation that is going to basically take us over for, to 1, x, and x squared. Now, if I transform, transform my vectors, okay, the my polynomial vectors, right, okay, into actual vector vectors in Rn, then all I'm going to get is I'm going to say, okay, well, this T of um, 1, 0, 0 is just going to equal, well, 1, 0, 0. And then T of 0, 1, 0, it ends up equaling 0, 1, 0, because that's what X is if we transformed our vectors in X into polynomials. And then finally, t of 0, 0, 1 is going to end up equaling 0, 0, 1. So now we'll get a matrix A. A will equal 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. Okay. And is A invertible? Yes. <laughs> Clearly. So by our previous theorem, right? Okay, we've got this inverse, right? So a t has an inverse t squared, or t inverse, excuse me, all right? And, right, that means p2r, and uh, t is, isomorph is an isomorphism, okay? And since t is an isomorphism, thus, P2R 
okay? And R3 are isomorphic. All right, so here's our transformation. This is technically the transformation. I utilize this, this change here in order to show that we have this matrix A, and I show that the matrix A is in fact invertible. There it is. Since A is invertible, T and T inverse have inverse, uh, T has an inverse, T inverse, and that means that T is an isomorphism. So P2R and I R3 end up being isomorphic, right? Super handy. I mean, like you're gonna find out like, if, especially if you're working in computer science, that oftentimes what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to like be able to transform whatever you're looking into, looking at into R N, okay, or maybe C N if you're working with complex numbers. Same thing if you're working in engineering and you're doing something actually that's really technical, right? You're doing a lot of creative work. Well, what are you going to have to do? You might actually have to transform whatever you're working in, okay, into say for example R N so you can work on it, all right? And if you do that. Okay, it like makes everything a lot easier to do. And this is the mathematical reason why we can actually do that. Why we can actually make changes between spaces, all right? So we wanna say to ourselves, okay, well, what's the requirement to have that happen? Well, one, okay, what I'm gonna need is I'm gonna need the dimension of the two spaces has to be the same, okay? And then two, I have to be able to generate an isomorphism. So basically I need to be able to generate an invertible matrix that takes from one space to the other space, and then necessarily we'll be able to go back again as well, okay? And that's what makes actually um, a two spaces be isomorphic, all right? The phrase isomorphism is basically synonymous with um, being invertible, okay? An isomorphism is necessarily a transformation that has an inverse, okay? and Two spaces are isomorphic if we can connect them with an isomorphism. All right, so this concludes the lecture, all right, on uh, invertibility with transformations.